even outside of whatever skills that you develop, say you never become a great uh, guitar player or a great singer or a great artist, but the the the, 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 the that discipline, that that willingness and and desire to keep working on something until you get better, these are skills that transfer into all other parts of your life. Uh, you know, same thing with sports. I mean, I think every every kid should should do some kind of sports, especially team sports. I mean, I can't overstate like how important some of the values I learned from being on teams and learning about teamwork and working together and, and being willing to fail and the, you know, uh, accepting defeat over and over again and, and making that part of your character. All of those things are things that come out of extracurricular activities like music and, and uh, the discipline of getting better at something, uh, sports, etc. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who've started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. If you haven't checked it out yet, our Sunday Quiver is like a behind-the-scenes DVD for the themes of the week's interviews. And if you're not on the newsletter yet, once a month you'll get access to a list of book recommendations, which will include books we've been reading, books written by our guests, and a whole lot more. And as always, today's episode of The Unmistakable Creative is sponsored by our friends at HostGator. So if you yourself have aspirations to do something like write a book, start a music album, uh, or any creative project of any sort, usually a website can be one of the most important first steps. In fact, I said in a recent Medium article, everybody should learn to build a website no matter what, because it's one of those skills that will always come in handy. And fortunately, our friends at HostGator can help you to get started because they're providing 30% off all of their hosting packages to unmistakable creative listeners. Uh, Not only that, they have 24-7 live support via phone, chat, and email. And if you don't know anything about building websites, they have an easy-to-use website builder if you're not tech-savvy. So visit HostGator.com slash creative and use a promo code creative for 30% off at checkout. Josh, welcome to the Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. Yeah, so I was referred to you by way of Jessica Abel, who uh, I just had a, a fascinating conversation with, and you were one of a handful of people she said you know we should have as guests on the show, and her entire list was stellar. So it's really uh, uh, you know fantastic to have you here. Um, so I want to start by asking, uh, what is it that your parents did for a living, and how did that impact the choices that you've made with your life and your career? Uh. Well, that's that's a good question, um, and it uh, I think you can trace a lot of my choices because of uh, what my parents did. My parents were actually um, divorced at a very at, when I was very young, so and I was brought up um, exclusively by my mother until I was about six or seven years old when I was kind of reintroduced to my dad, and he came back into my life. Um, But at that point, my mother and I were living out in Southern California, and my dad lived in New York. So I only started to really see him like once a year or so. But um, they were both very much nonconformists and uh, not uh, nine-to-fivers, let's say. Mm -hmm. Um, They were both very involved with the the political and free speech and – hippie and and uh drug and sex mo- movements of the 60s <laughs> <laughs> and um i was definitely a product of that era and um my mom is actually a pretty well-known artist who's still very active to this day um her name is martha rossler r-o-s-l-e-r and uh she has a very wide uh influence in the world of political art um uh, I guess you'd call it conceptual art, but her work ranges from video to performance to photography to multimedia installations and uh, real highbrow uh, political, um, uh, socially engaged work. And she was doing that, you know, back when she was raising me as a, when I was a small child. So that was very much the world I grew up in, the political foment of that period in the 60s and 70s and in Southern California and the Vietnam War and um, the, the women's movement, feminism, uh, you know, um, 
working against the, the, the Nixon administration, all of that sort of stuff. Um, and like I said, she didn't have a regular job. Um, she was a grad student and she was a, uh, assistant professor and, um, uh, somehow we cobbled a life together. Um, and then my dad was also, you know, very much a nonconformist and, uh, he, um, was a poet and, uh, uh, was working on various creative outlets and poetry and, and zines and, and self-publishing. And he had a very interesting group of friends and compatriots out um, on the East Coast. And then he did a lot of freelance work as an editor and as a writer. So he was, you know, when I would get to visit him during the summers um, on, in New York, he often had, you know, was able to make time to do stuff with me and and be around in ways that maybe someone with a more standard job wouldn't have been able to uh, to do. But I, I would say that both of them, you know, I never grew up with sort of any kind of idea of what a normal job was, um, what the expectations were for me, you know, to grow up and become a lawyer or a doctor or something. That was sort of never even part of the equation. Mm -hmm. And since I was an artist myself from a very young age, drawing comics, you know, starting at the age of four or something like that, uh, it just made total sense to me that I was going to grow up to be a an artist as well. Hmm. So a couple of questions come from that. Uh, what misperceptions do you think that we have about sort of nonconformist creative parents? And then, you know, what advice would you give to parents who are dealing with kids who are clearly not going to conform? <laughs> um what misconceptions do we have about nonconformist parents? I guess, you know, it's hard for me to say. I mean, I, I guess you're asking, like, what does – what does sort of mainstream America feel about people yeah, like that? Yeah, and, like what what is it that we think about it and what, what what's inaccurate about our perceptions of it? Because you've lived it. We probably have just read about it or heard about it. Right, right. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think that – I guess there are, like, some some – movies out there about parents who who took their kids on crazy adventures in the in the in the rainforest to live off the grid or um you know uh it sort of instilled some ideas of radical anti-americanism or something and and their children and and then their kids were not prepared for like the the real world um is that kind of what you're getting at yeah i guess that's one way of looking at it. i mean however you want to answer it i mean yeah that that's definitely one way of looking at it yeah, I mean, I, I don't. It's funny because I was just talking to my mother this weekend about sort of what it was like for her to move out to the, the West Coast in, at that period, having grown up in Brooklyn and gone to yeshiva and, you know, had very um, a, a sort of a quotidian life uh, from her family point of view, and then what it was like to 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 sort of go out into the the pioneering world of the, of late 60s California and mm -hmm. she said that she, she wanted when we moved out there she was still with my dad at that point that she had this idea that we would all live in a teepee <laughs> <laughs> um, like t totally off the grid and, and uh, uh, like just camp for our whole life mm -hmm. and uh, my dad was not into that um, so I didn't grow up that way um, but uh, yeah we were never we were never sort of like off the reservation or, or in a commune or, or somehow not engaged with what real world was like. Sure. Um, but I would say, you know, I grew up thinking my life was, I knew I was different and I was weird, but I also didn't know what it was like to be quote unquote normal. So, um, I always found it amusing to see my friends and kids that I would bring home as sort of the way that they would react to what our life looked like. And, you know, in, in some ways I wanted that life. I wanted uh, matching furniture and wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. And instead we had, you know, <clears throat> weird uh, Middle Eastern rugs on top of each other and Indian print pillows and artwork from all over the world and uh, strange books about uh, the subliminal messages of advertising and things like that lying around. Uh, but, um, you know, it was, it was, it wasn't until I got to be a teenager that I kind of like, then I started seeing that my friends thought it was cool that I was like different and that I lived in a loft, you know, and that my mom was an artist. And I started to see like the cultural value of that. So I, I would say that it was, 
it was a challenge for me as a kid who just wanted to be normal and get to see Star Wars when all the other kids got to see Star Wars, but I wasn't allowed to because it was too violent or got to read the superhero comic books or play with G.I. Joe action figures. And, you know, the, those were the sort of the obstacles that I had to uh, to get over. But I had all these other freedoms and, and sort of um, perspectives on the world that maybe my more quote unquote normal friends didn't have. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really what turned out to be really valuable for me later on in life and enabled me to have all sorts of experiences and meet all sorts of people. And, and, uh, I mean, we also traveled quite a bit, like as, as I got older and my mom got more successful, uh, we moved around a, a bit. So I ended up, uh, spending parts of, of, two different years in Canada, going to school up in Nova Scotia, and then also in Vancouver. Um, And, you know, my mom traveled abroad a lot and would bring back things from other countries that were really interesting and that my friends didn't have. So, I I mean, I I definitely, you know, uh, my mother would probably say I complained a lot and, and moaned about not having other things that all my friends did. But and that's probably true, but I definitely grew to value all those experiences later on in life when I sort of saw what, um, you know, most people's experience, most middle class white people's experience was like. And mine was definitely uh, had all sorts of other rhythms to it. Mm. So, I mean, uh, you're a parent now, right? So yes, I we have a nine year old daughter really curious you know when one you know how that has impacted the way that you raise you're raising your kids um and not only that like when parents who are listening to this are seeing you know tendencies for nonconformity in their kids how do they deal with that especially if they're not parents like the ones you had yeah it's interesting i mean i think i i try to be really conscious of that as a dad of to like not push my daughter too much in any one direction or the other or sort of like imposed from above well you know if your friends all want to do this and wear this kind of clothes or have this kind of thing done to their hair then you shouldn't do that because that's just conforming to what society and and uh, commercialism wants you know I I I try to present uh, an alternative perspective but not like impose it or judge like have her feel like she's being judged Mm -hmm. I'd say that that's one difference between the way I was raised and the way I try to be as a parent is really try not to um, make my daughter feel burdened by my judgments on her as much as I sometimes felt was happening in my life. Um, And I guess, you know, she's just starting to get to the age where these kind of social dynamics are starting to become very powerful especially amongst girls, there's all of this pressure, you know, that develops even at age eight or nine uh, about fashion and about, uh, you know, um, sort of group behavior and thinking about boys and all of that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's new territory for me because I wasn't a girl. I'm a boy. I was a boy. Um, And I grew up in a different time. And um, a lot of, a lot, I mean, I, I think... Our daughter, fortunately for us, she's always had a strong personality and a strong sense of who she is and what she wants. And so I sometimes I'm not even aware if that's conforming or not conforming, um, but I'm just I just love to see her being herself. Mm-hmm. And, and I like to just stand back and as long as she's not endangering herself, you know, to um, to really just let her be her best self and uh, talk to her about things that we think she's capable of understanding. I mean, this, this age that she's at now, now that she's nine, only in the last year and a half has she really cognitively been able to even have a perspective on, on her own life and desires and, and likes and dislikes enough to be able to, to talk about them abstractly, you know? And so it's been really exciting to sort of see her gain that ability and, and a sense of, of her place in the world and what the world is like. I mean, this, this election season, as you can imagine, has been fascinating to see through her eyes and to talk about Trump and Clinton and Sanders and Ted Cruz and all these people. Um, it, it strips away like all of the rhetoric, you know, of politics to sort of just try to frame some of these things so that a kid can understand 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and that, that's been really fun for all of us as a family, I would say. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> one of the things I know, you know, just from reading a bit about you is you've been drawing since you were four years old. Uh, yeah. So tell me about the moment when you realized that this is what you wanted to do. Um, was it really early in your life or was there any particular moment when you realized, yeah, this is it. This is the thing I'm destined to do. Well, see, comics was always my backup plan because my main plan was to be a major league baseball player. <laughs> really? <laughs> and I held on to that dream uh, probably until like age 13 when I realized that I couldn't hit a curveball. <laughs> um and was a scrawny little Jewish kid, uh, but uh, that was that was my number one goal. You know, that was what I thought about and was obsessed about um, for a long time. But um, the comics was sort of something I always did. It was just so much part of my of who I was. You know, like when you're when you're the only kid in your class who can draw, you sort of become you know the star or you know when certain things are needed to be done when it when a superman has to be drawn or when there's a mural that needs to be done or um when someone wants you to draw a horsey because they love horses you know uh that 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 was nice to have that kind of attention um and the comics part of it was just uh yeah, it's it's weird because I did it intuitively for so long before I started to even like understand what it is about comics that's really, you know, has dug its claws into me and what is so compelling about it as a form. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not like I sat down and I was reading, you know, Tintin or or Superman comic and I was like, huh, I'm very interested in the way these words and pictures work together and they they really draw the reader in and, and require this active participation on the part of the reader. I want to, you know, do that. <laughs> it wasn't the way it worked. It was just like, wow, this is a cool way to tell stories. And um, you get to draw really cool stuff and make the characters do what you want. And you're sort of like, it's it's like making a movie on the cheap and you're the actor and the cinematographer and the director and the writer and the special effects person and all wrapped it up into one. And full service uh storytelling going on here you know so um it was it was just something that was native to who i was and really the the journey for me has been moving from doing you know very typical comics for kids and then you know superheroes going through that whole phase and then sort of losing interest in that that whole genre uh, and then reinvigorating my love of comics when I discovered the world of nonfiction and alternative comics. Hmm. So as, as a comic artist, um, why do you think it is that we get to adult life and we have somehow inherited this narrative of I can't draw? Like, where does that come from? And, and you know, based on your experience of teaching people, uh, is that something that can be overcome? If so, how you know, I can tell you, you know, one of the, the profound realizations I had in the process of building Unmistakable Creative was I couldn't draw, but I could get people who could draw to collaborate with me and build the visuals that we have and give it the aesthetic that it has. Uh, but I'm much more interested in, in you know, what, what causes that narrative and how do you change it? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's something that, you know, I don't have a personal experience with because I was always like the talented kid it, mm-hmm. it, until I got to high school. And then I went to the specialized high school with all these other talented people. And there were a ton of other um, people who could draw way better than I could. So I sort of, you know, came up against that um, realization at that point. But uh yeah, you know, it just seems like it's this function of the way our education system works, where art is not is, is sort of like considered really important when kids are young, and then it sort of falls out of the curriculum mm-hmm. uh, at around middle school, and uh, and and then if you don't do it, you lose your ability to do it, and and if it's not something that you're given time for in your life and isn't made important. And is only done if it's something that you have a particular passion or, or you know, skill at. Then, like any other talent, it sort of, it sort of falls away. And we do tend to, you know, identify everybody by their particular talent. So then that person becomes the only one that that we turn to. You know, so like, I couldn't sing or play an instrument, so I was not in the bands. You know, mm-hmm. and I wasn't as good as. Uh, sports is some of the jocks, so they became the jocks, but I was the guy who did the art, you know, so sort of like 
when you're a kid, you do everything. You sing and you run and you play and you dance and you do, and you uh, draw and you're a little scientist and all that. But then everybody becomes like specialized in their particular thing, and and you, we lose this sort of whole creative self. Um, so it, it it's a. Uh, it's sad to see that that happens, and it's really true. I mean, I meet so many people who just say, oh, I can't draw, I can't draw. And I think actually one of the really interesting things that's happened in the world of comics in the last 15 years or so is that the sort of standard idea of what it means to be talented, a, a talented artist or draftsperson has been radically changed by all of the alternative comics and, and like some of the most, the biggest comics that have come out there. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, popular web comics like, um, uh, what is it? XTC, XT, no, what is it? Uh, XKCD mm -hmm. comic, um, which is basically stick figures. Yeah. Um, and there's some really great comics by, Creators, many of them women who didn't grow up drawing superhero comics. That you know, thank goodness for them because then they don't have to unlearn sort of like all the bad habits that one picks up drawing superhero comics. Mm -hmm. And maybe they didn't draw much at all, but they have a rudimentary skill and a really compelling, important story to tell. Um, and uh, voila, they make great comics. You know, so it's it's like the standards are changing about what is considered um you know what makes you a, what makes a great comic or what makes you a great cartoonist it used to be that you had to draw like you know i could throw out names of certain comic book artists from the the 70s and 80s that that you know drew these very quote unquote realistic you know figures and characters um and they could draw a perfect street scene in the background and you know, create a realistic world, but like the stories they were telling were not really very interesting at all. Um, and the, thus the comics that they were in are disposable trash, you know, but then there are artists like, I mean, just off the top of my head, um, Marjan Satrapi, who did Persepolis about growing up um, in Iran during the revolution there, you know, her art skills are rudimentary, but they're incredibly effective for the type of story that she needed to tell. And she used them to, um, to evoke a sort of Persian miniature style, you know, a throwback to a cultural practice of her people. Or there's somebody like Tom Hart, a uh, cartoonist who just did a book called Rosalie Lightning about his, um, the um, tragic death of his two-year-old daughter. Uh, but his art style is, you know, again, very simple and, and uh, not realistic in any sense, but uh, incredibly perfect for this type of stories that he tells and the, that type of story that he told in Rosalie Lightning. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, when I, when I teach, which I'm starting to do more and more now, and especially when we work with people who aren't like, you know, going to be professional cartoonists, but are maybe taking a workshop for a summer or, uh, they're in high school and they're just learning to, um, express, to tell stories, you know, with words and pictures that you can literally, you know, draw a very, very simple geometric s series of shapes and make that into a person and use that as your main character. And you can, you can make a really great and uh, emotionally resonant comic, you know, with those limited uh, tools in the, in the drawing side. Mm -hmm. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by our friends at Design Crowd. So, Let's say that the idea of design intimidates you or you don't have the resources to hire somebody really, really expensive. Well, fortunately, that's where a service like Design Crowd comes in because they make the equivalent of an entire creative team accessible to you at a price that's affordable to anyone. And here's how it works. Regardless of what your project is, whether it's an ebook, whether it's a flyer, a t-shirt, a logo, you go to Design Crowd, you submit your design brief. After you submit your design brief, you'll get anywhere between 60 to 100 submissions from designers from around the world. Uh, if you like what you get, you can then approve payment. If you don't like what you can get, you can actually go back to the crowd and ask for more, or you can ask for your money back. And because you're an unmistakable creative listener, you're getting a hundred dollars off your first design project. So visit designcrowd.com slash creative and use the promo code creative for a hundred dollars off your first design project. 
This episode is also sponsored by our friends at HostGator. So as I said at the beginning of the episode, building a website is one of those skills that will always come in handy for you, no matter what job you're in, especially given what a role uh, the internet plays in our lives today. Uh, Regardless of what your job is, this is one of those skills that you'll always benefit from. And fortunately, when it comes to building a website, our friends at HostGator are perfect for helping you get started because they're providing 30% off all of their hosting packages uh, for unmistakable creative listeners. They have an easy to use website builder, 24 seven live support. That's really awesome and reliable. And, um, if you're looking to move hosts, they're fantastic for that. In fact, a good amount of websites on the internet are hosted using HostGator. Uh, so visit hostgator.com slash creative and use the promo code creative for 30% off at checkout. So as a parent, um, who also happens to be an artist, uh, what is your view on education, given what you just said, you know, about the fact that we're taking arts out of the education? I'm just curious, you know, what you think of our current education system. Well, you know, I mean, it's a lot like how I feel about the way our edu- our public education system in this country is in a mess because it doesn't get proper funding and teachers don't get the support they need and um, I mean, I'm a big believer in public education. That was how I was brought up. That's how my wife was brought up, um, especially, you know, in the K through six sort of range. Mm-hmm. And um, I just think it's such a, a cornerstone of our country, uh, this idea of public education, that everybody's equal and everybody um, uh, should should have the opportunities to get an edu- a well-rounded education. Um, but unfortunately the realities are, you know, like at our school, which is, you know, an inner city school, I guess you could say, um, there's not enough money for basic supplies and the teachers often have to use these donors choose, um, basically like Kickstarter, little mini Kickstarter campaigns to get enough money to have like an air conditioner in the classroom or, you know, a whiteboard to, uh, So I don't know about you, but vacuuming is not one of those things that I ever look forward to doing. But as you know, your environment has a huge impact on your creativity. So I still like it to be clean wherever I'm living and working. But now it doesn't have to be something that you deal with. If you're like me and you grew up in the 80s, you probably fantasized about the day when cleaning your house would be like it was for the Jetsons, meaning you don't have to lift a finger. Well, the good news is that we're already kind of living in that future. And the easiest way to make sure your floors are clean every day is with the iRobot Roomba Robot vacuum. It cleans up after itself. The clean base automatic dirt disposal takes convenience to a new level, automatically empties its own bin into an allergen lock bag that holds 60 days of debris and traps 99% of pollen, mold, and dust mites so you can forget about vacuuming for months at a time. Let the Roomba clean for you instead. It learns your home, finds dirt, and empties itself on its own. It's got powerful cleaning performance made effortless. Remember, if it's not from iRobot, it's not a Roomba. To learn more, go to iRobot.com slash unmistakable. Basic stuff, a rug for the kids to sit on. You know, it's really, it's really uh, heartbreaking. Mm-hmm. Um, we just bought school supplies, and we had to buy. My daughter was saying, you know, we were asking her about some of the things that they ask on the list, like highlighters and and uh, you know, just um, various uh, post-it notes with lines on them and stuff. And she was saying she doesn't use any of those, but the teacher does. And it's like, oh, I guess. Every kid is being asked to supplement the teacher's supplies because the teachers have no other way of getting their own supplies. Like, it's a it's a, an unfair burden on the parents who don't have the money. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, how else the the, the teachers would be left with nothing because they, they otherwise they'd be forced to buy their own supplies for their job from their from their own personal salaries. You know, mm-hmm. it's like this is the bind that we're in. So when it comes to you know uh, electives like art and music and dance, things that are really, to me, so vital for a well-rounded development of people, um, those things fall by the wayside. So like this last year, my daughter had an art teacher um, and they had art the whole year and I I think they had it, you know, three or four times a a week, which is great. But like the year before that, there was no art teacher at all Um, and there was no music class, you know, so it's like there's always something that falls off uh, and, and... it's it's a real shame because yeah, I mean I can tell from your questions that you think that, it, that you agree that these kind that 
that art and music and dance and things like that are, are so vital to all of our development that we can't just focus on sort of, um, you know, uh, uh, efficiency skills or, or skills that will help you in the marketplace or something. You'll, we'll all end up as drones, you know. So what we ended up doing with a, a, a couple of other parents a couple of years ago was was putting together our own little once a week art class after school where all the, the kids who were in this little group would get together with an art teacher and and practice various um, techniques and learn about famous artists and and uh, try to get some some art in them that way. Mm. Yeah, I, I I love it. Yeah, I mean, I you're you're right. The reason I do ask those questions is because I do think these are the kinds of things that are critically important. I mean, I can honestly credit being uh, a music student to almost everything I've learned about practice and discipline in my life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean that's that's a hundred percent true. I I would agree that um, even outside of whatever skills that you develop, say you never become a great uh, guitar player or a great singer or a great artist, but the, the 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 that discipline that that willingness and and desire to keep working on something until you get better these are skills that transfer into all other parts of your life uh you know same thing with sports i mean i think every every kid should should do some kind of sports especially team sports i mean i can't overstate like how important some of the values i learned from being on teams and learning about teamwork and working together and and being willing to fail and the you know uh, accepting defeat over and over again and, and making that part of your character. All of those things are things that come out of extracurricular activities like music and, and uh, the discipline of getting better at something, uh, sports, etc. Well, let's do this. Let's shift gears a little bit. Um, I want to start talking specifically about comics. Uh, you know, Jessica and I kind of did a, a sort of surface level dive into this, but I, I really want to start looking at comics as an art form and really kind of how do you how do you dissect, understand, and and really you know put together a story in comic form because. I know that there's a lot more thought that goes into it than just say, okay, well, there's six panels and I just have to fill the panels. You know, what, what does the process actually look like? And if somebody is listening to this, you know, and thinking, I mean, the reason I'm asking this, because as I, as I'm, you know, hearing you talk about this, my own morbid curiosity of what if I started to draw comics where the actual drawing wasn't that good, but I could tell stories would be interesting. So I'm curious about the storytelling process for how a comic comes together. It's a great question, and I just have to preface my answer by saying that, like, every cartoonist goes about this totally differently. Like, every cartoonist has their own unique way of, of crafting their stories. So my way is very specific, um, but it is definitely not a blueprint for any other uh, person making comics, unless, for some reason, it, it appeals to you, you know, and it sounds right for you. But the thing about comics is, is that you're reading the the words and you're reading the pictures at the same time, right? And then there's this thing that goes on where those things work together in this sort of uh, magical way that is the inherent experience of of intaking a comic. And then there's also, you know, what happens in between at each panel, the 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 leap that you take as a reader when you sort of shift from panel one to panel two and you're filling in sort of all the information in between those. And that's sort of the magic of comics, which Scott McCloud in Understanding Comics sort of really defined and refined for everybody to understand. So, you know, uh, that's a, a call out to him for sure. But for me, when it comes to making, a, making comics, the first thing... For me, so all my work is based on nonfiction. It's all based on real life, and it's either based on stories that I've pers- personally witnessed or experienced, or stories I've been told, um, things that I've been interested in that have happened to other people. And the main thing for me, first of all, is you know when I think of doing a story, is this a story that already sort of works in my own mind, like uh, like. Or is a story that I told at a bar to a bunch of friends or at a party? Like, does it have, you know, the the components that make an interesting and exciting story? So, like, it's not enough to just take real-life things and make them into a comic book story because if you haven't 
if you haven't thought about what you're telling and, and thought about whether this story would be interesting um, to a reader, then you've already lost, you know, so it's, it's not going to work out. So that's obviously my first, my first thought. Um, and then I think, well, would this story work better in comic book form than in any, any other form? Would it work better than if it were just in prose and you couldn't see, you know, you couldn't visualize some of these things? Or would it work better as a poem or as a film or as a dance project? But if, it, if, if I answer that question, I say, yeah, this would r really work well as a comic because it has, you know, some really strong visual elements to it. It has dynamism. It has, um, you know, a character that you can really connect to and... Um, scenes that really sort of bring this story to life and drop you as the reader right into that experience, then I, then I consider making a comic. And my own process is that I, I actually usually write the story out in prose first, just so I sort of get all the foundations of it and make sure that it sort of, uh, you know, feels satisfying in terms of what we expect from a story, you know, that it has a character, that there has conflict, that it has, um, you know, an arc to it uh, that it has a satisfying ending, if not necessarily a conclusion, but just a feeling of like a completeness to itself as a story. And in that way, I almost do think of it as fiction. You know, I, th I, I try to construct stories that sort of feel like fiction in the sense that they feel like a story. Um, and so, you know, um, in my work, I, I think you'll find that it almost feels like it could be a made-up story, um, but then you have to keep reminding yourself, no, this actually happened, you know, the quotes in these dialogue balloons are actual quotes, um, the uh, the scenario that it's happening in is where it actually happened, and there, the proper research and, and reference has been done, all of those kind of things. So I first write it out like that, and then I, I try to identify the sort of the main story beats of this story, sort of like what are the moments... If I was to have to choose, because that's the job of the cartoonist, is to, is to choose your moments and choose your frame. You know, like what what visual um, elements can be shown that can that that work better as being shown than they would be being described. Because a large part of comics is is um, showing and not telling. You know, that's sort of where the art really is so important. And if there's big, you know, paragraphs that can be shown in, a, in an image rather than being described and written about, then, then that's great because that's sort of one of the key things that comics do so well is that they can take away a lot of that distracting stuff of having to describe, you know, a scenario um, and actually just throw you right into it. Um, so once I've identified those story beats and I start pulling out like dialogue and setting up my characters, then I really write a script as if I were writing a, a play, a screenplay or a movie script. So I'm actually describing panel one, you know, establishing shot of uh, the flooded city. You know, panel two, uh, we move in closer on the house and there's a caption that says the date and the time. You know, panel three, we see someone looking out the window and that now we've met our character and then we go in and we have this, this scene unfolding right in front of us. Um, and I actually write all of this stuff out for myself as if I were going to be handing this script off to an artist, to a different person to draw. But actually, it's going to be me who's going to be drawing it. Um, and for me, that just helps, like, makes makes sure that I'm sort of centered in the story and, and that um, I need to, I know what, referen what research I need to do, um, what images I need to find, what quotes I already have on hand that can be plugged in there, you know, all of those various elements, because mm -hmm. uh, that's always been part of my process, even when I was doing um, autobiographical stuff, was sort of like deeply interrogating myself, going back and finding my old journals or my old emails that I wrote about a particular experience and finding all my photos um, from that era, uh, you know, because I want to get all these little details right the, the, to really create that sense of very similitude and, and put the reader into that into that moment. Um, and the same thing goes when it's a work of journalism. So um, once I have my script done, then I thumbnail what I'm going to actually be drawing, and that's when I sort of put the puzzle pieces together and sort of look at a page, look at what space I have. And, you know, like you were saying, you don't just... Uh, have six panels that you need to fill, you want to kind of find a way to make those panels work together 
so that they, they work as a whole, but that they also lead one into the other. And often you want to find on each page, you know, one panel that sort of is the star panel of that page. Mm -hmm. Um, because you don't want a sort of monotonous reader experience where it's sort of like a panel that has the same amount of reader interest, panel after panel after panel, unless you're going for a story that has that kind of rhythm to it, you know? It's about creating a varied rhythm. So, and and like a lot of this stuff is just, like I said, it's intuitive and just sort of the way that I have always, um, or, or like since I was a teenager, thought about um, storytelling and comics. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, you fit those pieces together, uh, you thumbnail it in a very loose way, which sort of looks like storyboards from a film, which a lot of people are familiar with. You sort of are just putting the props and the characters and the word balloons and the captions around the panels so that they all fit and, you know, that the angles are right and um, that the reader is, is able to clearly follow the sequencing, you know. I mean, clarity is so important to comics. And uh, when my thumbnails are done, then I actually go and change hats and become the artist and sit over at my drawing table and spend many hours uh, doing the necessary work. And that's, you know, I, I work pretty much still in an analog fashion. So I'm actually drawing pencil on paper and with a brush inking on that paper. And then um, I do scan the pages in and, and clean them up in Photoshop and do some very simple color treatments in Photoshop. I'm, I'm trying to become more efficient and I'm starting to use uh, a Wacom Cintiq tablet mm -hmm. uh, to cut out some steps. Like I'm trying to find a way to take my, my storyboards and transfer them directly to the actual um, pencil pages, but it's, it's not something that's natural for me. And it's still, there's still something I value so much about having those actual physical pieces of paper and the feel of the pencil and the ink and the brush and all of that stuff that it's really hard for me to, um, to let go of, of the way I've been doing things for so many decades, you know? Wow. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by TrueCar. So there's something a lot of people don't know about TrueCar, and that's that you can also use it to buy a used car. If you haven't downloaded the app yet, it's really, really cool. With just the push of a few buttons, you can set the make, you can set the model, you can set the features that you want in the car, and you'll immediately see pictures, you'll be able to see the price that you'll likely pay, and you'll actually see the discount that you'll get. And you can even use it to connect with a local certified True Car dealer. So if maybe you're wondering if a lot of people are using True Car, well, over 500,000 pre-owned cars are on True Car, and over 2 million cars have been sold, and there's over 11,000 nationwide dealers. So yes, absolutely a ton of people are using True Car to buy cars. And not only that, TrueCar users save an average of $3,279 off the manufacturer's suggested retail price. So when you're ready to buy a new or used car, visit TrueCar.com or download the TrueCar app for a better car buying experience. And remember that some features are not available in all states. So, you know, I'm really glad you brought up tools because that was going to be sort of my, my next question is, it, you know, somebody listening to this, I'm sitting here thinking, okay, if I want to start making comics, um, you know, I know iOS actually, if I remember correctly, had something built into it at one point where you could actually use it to make comics. Um, and I'm guessing there are, you know, soft pieces of software that enable you to do that. Uh, but <clears throat> the other question I have um, really is about day-to-day -day habits and routines. You know, what does your typical day look like? Do you just get up and draw? Do you know that you're going to draw something every morning when you wake up? Because as a writer, I'm driven entirely by habit, routine, and ritual. So I'm very curious as a comic artist what that looks like for you. Yeah, it's a great question because my wife uh, is, is a fiction writer and she's very much like that too. Like she, when she has the space, you know, to be able to work, she has a very set routine and she likes to get up and write, you know, early in the morning and do X number of hours of writing and um, sort of structures her days around that. Um, for me, it's actually much harder to create a routine, partly because I'm a freelancer and I've always had to juggle like doing my comics with also doing freelance paying work um, and sort of, I've been fortunate enough for most of my adult career to be able to be doing stuff similar to comics to make money. So, you know, I did, I've done a lot of editorial illustration for magazines and stuff and um, I've done comics for hire for other places as well as doing my own work and it's only really in the last 10 years or maybe even a little bit less that I've been able to really focus on just being a cartoonist. But it, it sort of depends on what the deadlines are and what stage I am 
in the process. So if I'm working on a story, nowadays I'm working as a reporter first. You know, so first I'm going and doing a lot of research and obviously identifying the story I want to tell and then doing research about it, then identifying who I'm going to tell this story through and um, reporting, you know, if it means traveling somewhere to do the reporting I need to do or doing Skype like this or email or phone conversations, whatever it is, uh, I often will spend, you know, a month or more doing the reporting and then um, sort of transitioning that. I use a a program... um, called Scrivener mm-hmm. to keep all my notes together and everything. And, and uh, that then turns into um, what my script will be. And I'm starting to obviously think visually and, and sort of imagining images, you know, that I'll be doing, but I'm really just starting to write the script at that point. So the, the, the reporting and the scripting process can sometimes take months. So I'm actually not even sitting at a drawing table for, for months at a time. Um, which is weird because then, I, like we were talking about earlier, I can fall out of practice and I kind of have to get back into it. I'm not the kind of person who uh, obsessively and compulsively sketches like on the subway or anything like that. I don't. I haven't found it very useful in recent decades to just randomly draw things. Like I mostly am drawing for publication, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, when I do get to the drawing phase. Uh, I find it hard to draw before lunch. I don't know why that is, but there's lots of other work that needs to be done, whether it's doing marketing stuff for, you know, another story, or, you know, social media work, or just answering emails and scheduling appearances and all of the other crap that people have to do now um, for, <laughs> who have their own brand, you know? Yeah. Um, so uh, there's plenty of work, and plus being a dad and often taking my daughter to school and making her lunch and all of that sort of normal normal person stuff. But then um, uh, my my key areas of productivity are probably you know in the hours after lunch and before dinner, uh, which is when I'm every day sitting at the drawing table, um, gathering the reference I need, taping it up around the table, um, sitting there and just working. And and uh, usually I have like a baseball game or something on in the background. Uh, I, I, when I'm actually drawing, I, I'm um, able to kind of engage with the world, you know, and have conversations and and have things on in the background, have music or whatever. But when I'm uh, in the writing stage, that's like I need to be a hermit, you know. Then then that's when I need quiet and, and nobody else around and um, really need to focus uh a hundred percent on that task, but when I'm drawing, somehow I'm able to be a little more. Uh, it's not multitask, but just sort of be more in a public space. Mm-hmm. So, um, this again is, is another question out of personal curiosity. What, if any, resources would you direct people to, um, in addition to understanding comics, if they were wanting to start exploring this as a potential art form, or just exploring this as one way of expressing yourself? Well, um, there's lots of websites out there, um, you know, about about tools and, and how to use them and, and YouTube videos that show how to use a lettering guide and how to use a brush pen and all of that sort of things. But I still go back to certain books, you know, like Understanding Comics, I think, is a book that everybody in America and the world should read because it just opens up one's, one's appreciation for the form of comics. Um and just as a reader, you know, it was a huge revelation for me. Uh, but Scott McCloud also made another book more recently called Making Comics, mm-hmm. which is much more geared towards the people who actually want to uh, make their own comics. And so I feel like it's a really important uh, component to understanding comics. Like, sure, everybody should read under- Understanding Comics, but those who want to make comics should read Making Comics. And he really breaks down... Um, he, his dad was an engineer and, uh, he grew up, I think with a similar way of looking at the world as sort of like trying to understand everything in, in identifiable ways and sort of categorize them and make order out of the seeming chaos of life. And so his method, you know, is something I actually really relate to and connect with because I have a similar way of trying to make sense of the world. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, he breaks down a lot of the stuff that I talked about about my process just happens to be very similar to the way that 
um, Scott McCloud talks about the process of making comics as well. Um, and so he talks about all the different choices, you know, that you have to make as a cartoonist, whether it's choice of frame or image or word or um, angle, you know, all of these various things. The editorial choices, like sort of what you're leaving out and then the choices of what you're leaving in and thinking about the way that the different types of panels work together. You know, there's... there's um, panels that are really focused more on the words and the pictures more illustrate the text and there are you know panels where the the art is primary and the text just sort of adds flavor to it and then there's panels where the art and the text are working in opposite directions and there's sort of two narratives going on he, he identifies all these various things so that you know like what the tools are in your toolbox even if you would never end up using 80 percent of them um and those are all like those it those are not relevant to what your skills are as an artist. You know, those are all things that anybody can learn, whether you, all you can do is draw stick figures or whether you can draw like Michelangelo. So um, I, I find that really useful and I use it in my workshops with students and stuff. And then there's another book um, by Ivan Brunetti, uh, who was actually a cartoonist that I knew in um, Chicago when I was out there when I met Jessica Abel as well and um, his book is called Cartooning Philosophy and Practice and it's a very thin volume that is really just about like sort of like what why do you want to tell stories in comics what is it about comics that are so compelling um, and, you know, what can we understand about the very urge to make comics that will help us when we do choose to make comics? And it's almost like it's a short course in comics making. And it's, like, divided up into, like, five weeks, you know, of, of lessons and, and things you can do at home um, that really the most rudimentary artist can do. Because his, you know, his method is to show everything in, like, these very simple geometric shapes and to think more about, like sequencing and sort of like interrogating yourself as a as a person to get to the heart of the story that you're trying to tell um becoming just much more of an efficient visual storyteller so again these the lessons that you learn i'm, I'm just starting to understand this but i think the lessons that you can learn from doing comics can apply themselves in a lot of other um you know uh expressions in life even if it's making a good powerpoint presentation um if you really understand principles of of the way words and pictures work together uh you can make a really great powerpoint <laughs> and that can be useful in your life awesome well josh this has been just fantastic um so much fun like you've packed it with so many interesting nuggets so i have one last question for you which is uh how we finish every interview at the unmistakable creative what do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable hmm um uniqueness i guess i mean uh that's an overused word but I think one of the things that I've really come to treasure about the type of work I do is sort of appreciating how everybody out there is to to be simplistic is is their own superhero. You know, like when I, when my when I switched from doing superhero comics to doing comics about the real world and real people, and I was inspired by like people like Harvey Picard in American Splendor telling the most quotidian experiences of his life was just sort of appreciating like what an amazing world we actually have here in front of us that we're all living and the choices that everybody makes when you start to really just talk to somebody and get their story and and realize the choices that they've made and the brave things that they've done um that is where you appreciate the uniqueness of everybody of each individual person and if we had more room to to stop and 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 pay attention to each of each other and and our uniqueness instead of always thinking about Iron Man and Thor and and Superman and these and characters from Star Wars and people that don't really exist and never will exist, um, but but focus on the life that we're all living in the moment um, and appreciating what makes each person unmistakable. I think that is that that would be a world that that I'm trying 
that I'm kind of um, trying to put a spotlight on. Does that kind of get to the question? Yeah, yeah no, it definitely does. Um, <clears throat> well, this has been just fantastic. Where can people learn more about you and your work? Well, uh, you can find me on the web um, at joshcomics.com. That's J-O-S-H-C-O-M-I-X. And on Twitter at Josh Newfeld. Awesome. Well, like I said, this has been just uh, amazing. You've packed it with so many insights and kind of re-inspired me to want to start exploring comics as a a form of expression. And uh, for everybody listening, we will wrap the show with that.